Hello, everyone. Welcome to our podcast, Mayors Breaking It Down. So today, my co-host is the Mayor Van Johnson from the great city of Savannah, Georgia. Welcome, Van. Hey, good to see you. Thank you so much. And um, always great to have, have great mayors breaking it down. Right. And today we have the amazing Mayor Eric Adams from the great city of New York. Welcome, Mayor Adams. Thank you so much, Phyllis. And good seeing you, Brother Johnson, Mayor Johnson. You know, I'm looking forward to this uh, important conversation. All righty, let's jump in. This conversation is going to be about public safety and gun violence, which we know is a big subject for us right now. So, Mayor Adams, I know that you ran on public safety. Can you tell me why that was so important for you at this, this season? Well, let's say, you know, sometimes words are powerful. And throughout my entire campaign, I stated that public safety and justice uh, they are the prerequisite to prosperity. They go together. They must coexist. Uh, if we don't have the safety uh, that we deserve, uh, it is going to be <laughs> virtually impossible uh, to have uh, thriving cities. And that includes our economic development. The real economic stimulus is being able to attract businesses that would allow people to be gainfully employed and you do that in an atmosphere where people feel safe, the children can go to schools in a safe way, and you can live in your communities in a safe way. And I'm a big believer of that that's the foundation that we built on. Mr. Mayor, um, you, like I, served in law enforcement. You uh, were borough president. I wanted to know what your thoughts were um, in serving on the ground and now seeing um, law enforcement from the administrative, from the governance side of it. It's so important to do that analysis, and I'm glad you, you asked that. I, I think those who are former uh, military, former law enforcement, uh, those who have served in some form of public protection, you bring a unique perspective uh, to uh, how you govern. Uh, you see things in a real way. You know, I remember when I came into office and I stated that I was going to put in place a modified Plain, a plain clothes unit that will wear articles of police clothing. Uh, many people push back on that. Uh, but I understood that bad guys uh, need the element of surprise. And units don't create abusive police behavior. People assigned in those units create abusive police behavior. Our job is to have the right people assigned. And in government, uh, you bring your experience uh, from uh, being on the front line to crises. You know, I always tell the story of Mayor Johnson of the 11 year old child who was arrested several times for robbery. And when I finally got him to talk, I learned that he was, his dad was in jail for murder. His mother was hooked on crack cocaine and he was out of school for over 30 days and no one even checked on him. Th those issues create much of the crises that we see. And so it's a different, perspective when you bring a frontline view into the role of being a mayor. Wow. So Mayor Adams, what has been like the most complex issue you've seen in public safety and gun violence since you've taken office? Watching something that is beyond your span of control, uh, the over uh, uh, proliferation of guns, uh, the fixation, our national uh, government and uh, some of our leaders in Congress, particularly our, our Republican uh, leaders, uh, how we're fixated on guns. It's, it's unbelievable when you think about the number of guns that are produced outside our cities and make their way into our cities. It's extremely impactful. And you look at places like Chicago, uh, Washington, DC, uh, New York City, Philadelphia, look at all of these places and you find yourself are really having to deal with the mass production of firearms and how they easily find their way into our cities. Uh, we removed over 7,000 guns off our streets. Uh, we removed a substantial record number of ghost guns um, off our streets, but they continue to come. And it's, it's, it is extremely challenging uh, to deal with the gun culture that we have in our country. We continue to do the job, uh, but a lot of this goes beyond our span of control. 
And, and Mayor Adams, you brought up ghost guns. And I know we use that term a lot in, in our lane, but the general public sometimes doesn't even know what we're talking about. Can you tell us really define ghost gun for us? Yeah, and that's a great question. Every gun that is legally produced uh, must have a serial number attached to it. It allows you to trace back that gun and get the history of that gun. Uh, ghost guns don't have ser serial numbers. And in far too many cases, uh, they can be uh, produced uh, using 3D printing, uh, using uh, just shipping parts of guns together and then assembling at, your, at one's home. And so it is really a gun that flies be, below the radar and it makes it extremely challenging for law enforcement officers across the country and it makes it extremely dangerous uh, for communities. Uh, we're finding more and more ghost guns are showing up with shootings, robberies, and other dangerous crimes. Mr. Mayor, um, just for purposes of context, you, you, you're the mayor of the um, largest city in our country. How large is your, your police force? A, a little over 30,000, about 32,000. 32,000, that's the size of, us, of some cities in our, <laughs> our country. Um, you've really made it a point of leveraging technology. Um, and really um, pu uh, addressing public safety smarter. And tell us about some of those efforts. Well, we have, we have just begun. Uh, technology is important to me. I believe wholeheartedly in technology and we cannot be afraid of it. We can't abuse it. We must stay within uh, our national constitution as well as the state constitutional safeguards and guardrails. Uh, but we must use technology to keep us safe. Uh, and we're going to continue to do that. Everything from detecting fentanyl, uh, we, we're going to see what technology is out there, robotic dogs, robotic robots to do inspections. Some shopping malls in this city, uh, in this country, will use robots to do routine patrols in their shopping malls and other locations. Uh, we believe that we should be using all forms of technology. There are, there are new forms of video surveillance that we are looking at that could determine if a person displayed a gun publicly, or if there's a fight that's happening somewhere, we're using video cameras uh, to properly train our police officers. Our police officers, we have one of the largest expansions of video camera, body-worn cameras that allows you to get to the heart of what happened at a circumstance or at an incident. And so I'm a big technology guy. And we also use it to uh, predict what crimes are taking place through the CompStat era. Uh, there's ver various forms of technology that we're using. Uh, we met uh, two weeks ago with a, a group of 10 Israeli companies uh, to ask them to do a display of what technology they're using wow. in their country. Uh, we're looking at it and we're just really sending out a signal across the globe that this is the place where we want to test technology. Now, Mayor, you know, I'm a former mayor's chief of staff, and one of the issues I used to hear all the time as it relates to technology is in Black communities, so we put apparatuses in there to monitor if there's a shooting and we can hear the gunshots, um, like a shot spotter and things like that. And then I even remember when we first brought out the body cams for uh, for police officers and they were concerned about, you know, that body cam being on there and recording everything they were doing. How do we get around making sure that people just don't feel like we're spying on them, i.e. whether it's the people in the neighborhood, because most of the time it's our neighborhoods, more inner city, um, urban, black neighborhoods and underserved areas or police officers and, and where there's the good and the bad, how do we, how do we make sure we embrace their, their concerns? Well, first you do it by ignoring the noise. There's, there's a big difference between those who are the loudest, but the smallest focus on the people on the ground. I have not attended one community meeting in a high crime area, uh, not one church gathering, uh, not one block association meeting where people say, hey, we don't want technology, we don't want police. If you allow the numerical minority that loud, that yells the loudest uh, to control how you keep cities safe, uh, you'll never get them safe. And uh, you know the same people who say that we don't want video technology, you don't hear them at all when they talk about the horrific overproliferation of guns, the gang violence, and some of the other crises that our cities are facing. We must stay focused and true. 
as the, as mayors, we know we're not going to use items that's going to be abusive to our communities. We know uh, that we're only going to use to tools effectively, fairly, and within the constitutional safeguards. But to state that in affluent areas, they're going to use every form of technology to keep their residents safe, but we're not going to do it in our public housing. We're not going to do it in communities that are dealing with uh, with violence and gun violence. That is just the wrong way to think, and that's the wrong way to operate. Uh, some of my uh, top corporations in this city are using all forms of technology uh, to make sure that their employees are safe and the communities that they're in are safe. So I'm going to use those same level of technology to make sure my residents are safe. Mr. Mayor, um... Uh, living in the time and the context, the extraordinary ex uh, circumstances that we are currently living in, you've been quite open and forthright. Um, and I think you have a unique perspective uh, given all that's happening in Memphis and across the country. I wanted to know uh, your thoughts, uh, not only as a former police officer, um, but as a black man. Um, and, and again, just you know, seeing what you know professionally, knowing um, some of your experiences uh, growing up and wanted to know what your thoughts have been about what we've all experienced. No, these, these, are, these are interesting times that we are living in uh, and what is happening uh, with the officers that you saw in Memphis uh, over the weekend and how we are going to have to think about properly training our police officers, number one, in the area of de-escalation, uh, number two, making sure you have the right fit for the assignments. I say this all the time. Uh, people believe uh, just because one is a police officer that they could do every assignment in the police department. That's wrong. Uh, because you are a doctor does not mean you could be a brain surgeon. And I don't want a podiatrist operating on my brain. Uh, we need to pinpoint what roles you're going to do that you have the basic skills, not only the foundational skills, but what type of person you are. And when you're doing a plain clothes assignment or a assignment when you're modified uh, uniform, there's a special type of training characteristic and mannerism you must have. The person who's in my community affairs unit uh, that interacts uh, with children and families every day, not the same person I want that has the skills to kick in doors and go do a warrant search and vice versa. And so that when I saw the video, what happened in Memphis, it was clear to me that number one, I felt there was a level of comfortability to that overaggressive policing. But number two is clearly those officers did not have the temperament uh, to do an assignment of that magnitude. And I believe we have to be honest with ourselves uh, when we put give police officers assignments, we need to ask the questions, what are your skill set? What are your mannerisms? How well are we training you? Uh, to de-escalate situations. And then we have to build into our training like we're doing in New York. Who's the person that's going to take control of the scene? Who's going to uh, stop the other colleagues from going across the line? Everyone should have that training, but there's always at the beginning of the day, we should identify uh, who is the team leader at these scenes? Who's gonna respond? Who's gonna take control? No one took control of the situation we saw in Memphis. Uh, no one took control of what we saw uh, with Brother Floyd. Uh, you can go over to Eric Gardner. All of these situations you're seeing, no one is on the scene taking control, really having the muscle memory of identifying when things are getting out of control. And that's a, a big problem, and we must train to that. And historically, we have not. How do you encourage you know, your, your citizens and those who want to take that blanket of what happened in Memphis and apply it to all uh, police officers everywhere? How, how do you say that, you know, this is the exception and it's not the rule? Well, again, I always point back to what I hear on the ground. I'm very much on the ground. And the communities uh, that uh, I know in this city, uh, they're clear. Uh, they don't want abusive police behavior, but they want their police there doing their job. Uh, when you come off the subway station, which we have an expansive subway system here, 3.9 million riders a day. Uh, when you come off the subway station or you in that subway station and you see that blue uniform, 
there's a level of calmness that comes over you. You People want their police all over this country. They want the police to do their job in a professional manner. It's more than just uh, the Floyd type cases that people get concerned about. It's the daily disrespect that people see that really builds up to uh, the anxiety. If we train our police to interact, to know how to communicate, to know how to be proactive in building relationships, many of the things we're doing here in the city, uh, we will get a better product from our police officers. It's unfortunate that the only time historically that police officers deal with communities were during times of trauma. We want to be more proactive and build out those relationships before a traumatic experience. You know, no one calls the cop to invite them to a birthday party. They call them when shots have been fired at the birthday party. If that's the only time you interacted with the public or when the public interacted with you, then you start to identify yourselves as negative encounters and negative relationships. We are proactive. We want our cops at boxing uh, 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 meet. We want them in basketball tournaments. We want them visiting churches. We want them stopping in community meetings and talking to children in schools. Uh, we want them to be engaged so they know who the community is and the community will know who the police officers are. Yes. Thank you, Mayor Johnson, for joining us today. And thank you, Mayor Adams. I got to end with a personal question. Can you define, you are known as the mayor with swag. Can you define <laughs> swag? <laughs> uh, uh, you, you know, and it's interesting as being an African-American mayor, uh, I've learned um, throughout the histories, uh, Black mayors have to uh, really try to almost be invisible. Uh, you know, you're, you're afraid of what people think. You're afraid how you're perceived. Are you too black enough? Uh, are you too white enough? Uh, you know, what are your, your, your policies? And it's almost you are in a perpetual apologetic posture. Mm -hmm. And I refuse to do that. You know, I was elected by the people of this city. I'm very confident on my skills and my abilities. Uh, I did not get here because uh, my dad was a, a former mayor or because I belong to some prestigious uh, golf cl uh, club. No, I got here the good old fashioned way I earned it. You know, I was, I was, uh, I openly talk about being dyslexic. I openly talk about being arrested. I openly talk, open, openly talk about living on the verge of homelessness. And so when you can become the mayor of the most important city, in my opinion, on the in the most important country, then you should have a level of confidence every time you walk out your door and you should walk with that confidence. And to me, uh, our young people need to see that, uh, that be confident in what you are obtaining and everything you do, you should be confident. Now, the way you speak, the way you dress, the way you handle crises, uh, the way you face down the challenges. Uh, when you lead from the front, people will realize uh, that you're capable of leading under any circumstance. And to me, that's what swag is. Swag is leading through COVID, leading through crime, leading through, leading through monkeypox, economic uh, challenges, asylum seeker crisis, all of those issues of, you know, mama used to say when I was a little boy, never let them see you sweat. You have not see, see you have not witnessed a bead of sweat on my, on my forehead. We got this. Phyllis, let me just tell you, and I've had the opportunity to be with the mayor on uh, several occasions in my hometown, New York, in Brooklyn, New York. This man's a beast. He doesn't sleep. I mean, I'm like, I need to sit down somewhere. I mean, he is everywhere <laughs> all the time. I don't know how he does it. I think they have to, he has to plug himself up somewhere. Uh, but there, uh, you've been certainly an inspiration to us, and we thank you for offering your, your expertise to mayors across the country. And, um, you know, you have helped to bring us all closer together. We appreciate that. Thank you. And I'm just so happy you uh, left the city because I did not want to run against you. So you yeah. stay down there. Don't come up here. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you, everyone, for joining us today. It's a wrap, you guys. Thank you. Thank you. you. Take care. Good to see you all.